It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about recent work in machine learning, past, present, and future. I'm sorry I'm not able to join you in person in Madrid, and I'm sorry that we had technical difficulties during the actual conference, but I hope everyone who attended the conference will have a chance to uh, view this recording of my presentation. So the outline for the presentation is as follows. Uh, first, I'll begin by talking about machine learning past, then I'll review the present, and then I'll talk about the future. And in particular, I'll spend uh, time talking about three different topics uh, that are challenging machine learning in the present, and then five topics where I think machine learning is going for the next five to 10 years. So what is the origins of machine learning? Well, I think the fundamental question of artificial intelligence has been always, how do we build smart software? And if you asked an artificial intelligence practitioner, say around 1980, what they would do, they would say, well, I start by interviewing an expert, then I encode their knowledge in software. And this worked well for the area of expert systems. And we saw a uh, proliferation of such systems in the 1980s and 90s, including uh, the famous Meissen system for medical diagnosis of blood disease, Digital Equipment Corporation's XCON system for configuring computer hardware systems, and the Dendral system for interpreting mass spectrograms. But uh, this approach does not work well for other tasks. Uh, for example, if, I, if you ask someone, well, how do you recognize optical characters, uh, handwritten characters, they can't really tell you the steps they go through. Or if I ask you right now, uh, what are the steps that you go through in your brain in order to understand the words I'm saying? Or if we think about robot control or driving, uh, tell me the steps that you're using as you're controlling your car and deciding when to brake. And so uh, this led to a kind of a crisis, uh, I would say, or, or a rethinking. Um, and so 10 years later, if you'd ask someone about these kinds of tasks, how should you do them? They would say, well, you should collect training examples and learn a function that maps from the input to the outputs. And that's because for these kinds of tasks, uh, recognizing handwritten characters, for example, it's very easy for us as humans to do the task. The problem is that we can't explain how we do the task. So we can do the task and collect, it's easy for us to create training examples. And so this was the birth of machine learning as a part of computer science. So uh, in the 20 years from 1980 to 2000, many new algorithms were developed. Uh, decision trees were developed and became extremely popular as a kind of off-the-shelf method. Support vector machines developed uh, very high performance and very mature mathematics. The whole field of probabilistic graphical models, including such simple classification techniques as naive Bayes, were shown to perform very well. And finally, ensemble methods such as bagging and boosting could, were shown to, that they could be applied to all of these and even improve performance further. One other thing that occurred during this time was that uh, there was a shift or a, an additional um, direction that emerged, leaving from function learning, which was the fundamental uh, formulation of the machine learning problem, to knowledge discovery. These learning algorithms succeed in performing a task because they find interesting patterns in the data. And some algorithms are able to reveal those patterns in easy to understand ways. So for example, decision trees uh, can show you a giant if then else kind of structure um, for how they make their explanations. And on the right here is the big ML tree visualization system. Uh, the method of association rules was developed for finding sets of items that tend to co-occur. And these are also very uh, easy to understand. And even probabilistic graphical model techniques such as naive Bayes give you a very nice visual and, and statistical summary of your data. So the field of data mining and knowledge discovery uh, developed to focus on discovering and visualizing these patterns. Well, what is happening now in machine learning in the present? I want to talk about three things that I think are important trends today. The first is an automated decision making. So if we think about situations like making recommendations to a customer or placing advertisements, uh, say on Google or Facebook or uh, robot control and self-driving cars, in all of these situations, 
one interesting aspect of them is that you only learn the outcome of an action if you try that action. You are not told what the best action would have been. And this is generally called bandit feedback. Okay, so uh, and this is uh, uh, by analogy to slot machines, which are sometimes known as one-armed bandits, right? And you can see here we have four slot machines and um, each one, let's say each of these slot machines, if you pull the arm, it has a certain probability of paying off. On average, it will pay off some amount of reward R1. And this machine maybe has another different reward R2, R3, and R4. Well, uh, in each trial, you have to choose one of these four machines and pull its arm, and then you find out, and then you get a payoff from it with some probability. And the general goal of the multi-armed bandit problem is to try to figure out which of these machines has the highest expected payoff so that you can just pull the arm of that machine. But this is true for making recommendations. If I recommend a movie to a customer, I don't find out what was the best movie I could have recommended. I just find out whether they liked that movie. And when I present an advertisement to a customer, uh, I find out whether they're willing to click on that advertisement and maybe whether that click leads to making a purchase but I don't know what would have been the best, most profitable advertisement to show them. And of course, in controlling a robot, we turn the steering wheel a certain amount, we press the brakes a certain amount. We don't know if those were the optimal decisions, we just find out how well those particular decisions worked. So one thing that's important to realize is that automated decision making requires experimentation. Uh, for instance, with those slot machines, we need to try all of them at least a little bit to find out how good they are. And so we often need to systematically try all actions in many different situations to learn when each action pays off. And when analyzing historical data, like which advertisements a user clicked on, we need to keep track of what advertisements were displayed to that user, not just the ones that they clicked on. Uh, and so th that, that's an additional challenge when we're doing decision making. Well, let me briefly talk about algorithms for uh, this kind of problem. Um, one kind of algorithm is known as the contextual bandit. The idea is that the contents, uh, that, 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 that these one-armed bandits are not just paying off with some probability, but the payoff depends on the contents, uh, the context. So for example, when presenting an advertisement, the contents of the web page acts upon which we're presenting the advertisement, that we call that the context. And the different bandits that we might uh, pull arms on are the different actions available to us. And what is learned is a function known as the Q function, which estimates the value of performing action A in context X. And so there are algorithms called contextual bandit algorithms that balance the exploration or experimentation process of trying different actions in different contexts with the exploitation, that is, trying to get payoffs by choosing the action that maximizes the Q value in, in a given situation X. Well, another area that's very important is reinforcement learning. Uh, so we're in the contextual bandit setting, we just take one action and then we get a payoff. Uh, and then the problem is over, and now in the next, uh, next web page, we, we get another uh, choice, but they're independent of each other. But in reinforcement learning, we're interested in how the actions we perform now may influence future uh, states of the world and future actions we might have available. So in this model, each action causes the world to move to a new state. So starting in X1, we perform action A1. This causes the world to transition to state X2, where we maybe choose action A2 and so on. And an action may be good be either because it provides an immediate benefit or because it moves the state of the world towards states that will give us bigger payoffs in the future. So we might even do actions that are painful in the short term because they're beneficial in the long term. The immediate benefit or cost is, expect is expressed as a reward uh, value R of XT. So I've added the rewards that we get in each of those states. And finally, our goal is to maximize the total benefit or the total reward. So the sum of those rewards over that time period. Now, there are many examples of reinforcement learning problems. Uh, of course, we could consider a self-driving car in which the state of the world is the location, speed, and acceleration of the car. And the actions are things like steering, accelerating, braking, 
And the rewards are things like reaching our destination quickly, not colliding with people, obstacles, or other cars, conserving fuel, and so on. Another example that's been in the news very much lately is playing the game of Go. And the state of the world is the state of the Go board. The actions are placing stones on the various uh, free points in the board, and the reward is either you win or you lose. Perhaps more relevantly in industry, there are many, many problems in operations, logistics, inventory management, uh, you know, marketing and so on, where we make decisions now that will have influence on future state and, uh, and reinforcement learning type techniques would be perfect for working on these problems. Well, let me talk about the second area of, that's very interesting in current day machine learning, which is deep learning for perception. So standard machine learning algorithms of the type that were really developed in the 80s um, and the 90s require that the data be converted into meaningful features. And this is sometimes called feature engineering. This is usually pretty easy for typical database style information. Database records say about a patient in a hospital, their temperature, their age, their blood pressure, things like this, those are meaningful features. But it's very difficult for signal level data, say images, videos, acoustics, uh, things like this, um, vibration sensors on jet engines, where um, it's, very, it's much more challenging to develop features by manual engineering. And the uh, big advance in the last uh, decade or so has been uh, the reapplication re of methods for deep learning that were developed back in the 1990s. Um, and they're having huge payoffs in problems of perception or signal type data because these deep learning methods are able to automatically discover the meaningful, inter meaningful intermediate features so that we can start with a raw image as we see over here of this dog and we can apply what are called convolutional units and pooling units and convolutional units and pooling units and so on until finally we've reduced the information in this image down to a single unit which says is there a dog in the image or not. So deep learning has led to uh, dramatic progress in object recognition. So uh, one of the standard challenge problems that the computer vision community works on is known as ImageNet or the ImageNet 1000. So 1000 categories of objects uh, taken from images taken off of the web. And uh, one measure of performance is uh, if we look at the top five uh, most likely uh, classes, class of objects output by the computer vision system, what is the uh, uh, probability that the true answer does not belong to one of those top five? So that's the top five classification error. Each image in this case has only one class of object in it of interest. So in 2010 and 2011, uh, we, were, were, we were using uh, manually engineered or, or hand-coded feature me methods. And starting in 2012, deep learning was brought to bear. And so we can see that we went from error rates above 25% down to error rates in the you know, 6 and 7% range. Um, and, our, and these continue to improve. So this is a dramatic improvement, right? Really a factor of 5 reduction in our error rate. We've seen similar progress in speech recognition. This is a, a bit older data from uh, Google showing that back in 2013, before they were applying uh, deep learning methods, they had a word error rate of 23%, meaning that basically one out of every four words that you spoke to a spoken language recognition system would fail. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the, qual the accuracy of speech recognition systems based on hand designed features was pretty much stuck at this level for more than a decade. But with the development of deep learning techniques, this has been driven down to 8%. And there was a recent posting I saw on Twitter that it's down uh, in the 4% range now today. Well, uh, I think it's interesting to step back and, and uh, note some things. So in traditional machine learning techniques such as decision trees and uh, random forests and support vector machines, um, the basic algorithm is unchanged. As you go from one problem to another to another, um, all you do is input the data in feature form and you can just run it. 
But with deep learning, you need to design a network architecture for each new problem. Um, now, there are, obviously, there is a lot that you can learn from one problem that you can apply to the next. But deep learning is really more a form of programming than it is just using an off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm. There isn't like one deep learning architecture that you can apply to all your problems. So to develop a deep learning application, the programmer designs a task-specific deep network. This network must be differentiable so that the network parameters can be adjusted by a gradient descent search, which is a derivative following search. Modern deep network tools compute the derivatives automatically, so you really don't have to know any calculus to make this stuff work. But right now, deep learning programmers are exploring the design space of differentiable programs on a wide variety of tasks to try to understand what are the pat patterns and programming idioms that work well. So we know convolutional blocks and pooling blocks work well. We know about something called long short-term memory gates. There are various forms of associative memory that have been developed, autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, many different building blocks um, that the community is learning. But this is a form of programming, and I call it differentiable programming. I, that's not unique to me, but this is many people call it differentiable programming because it's a new style of programming and we're still learning how it works. So it is still very hard to get a deep learning application to work unless it is very similar to uh, an existing published application. For example, if you want to recognize objects and images, uh, we're finding that it's quite uh, feasible to take pre-trained networks and network architectures that have been published by Google and Facebook and, apl and apply them with very moderate amount of retraining to those problems. But if your application does not exactly match these previous ones, then you have a lot of work ahead. A third area that's very exciting in current machine learning research is anomaly detection. So in many applications, we have a large amount of data describing what we might call the normal behavior of the system, the normal behavior of the user, and so on. And our goal is to detect anomalous behavior, which maybe is very rare. So consider fraud detection, say for credit card transactions. The normal behavior is good customers and the vast majority of credit card transactions are, are not fraudulent, but the abnormal behavior is fraudulent customers. Or cyber attacks, so the normal behavior might be normal flows in the network, normal execution of programs on my laptop and so on. The abnormal behavior might be network flows caused by cyber attacks. Or in machine diagnosis, the normal behavior might be normal sensor readings on a machine, the abnormal behavior, some sort of unusual sensor readings that might signal an imminent failure of the machine or a need for uh, servicing and repair. One point I want to make is that it's usually not safe to assume that abnormal behavior comes from a fixed probability distribution. If we think about fraud detection, there are always uh, the, it's, a, it's a, a kind of arms race between the fraudulent, uh, uh, the people committing fraud, and those of us trying to detect it. The same with cyber attacks. Perhaps in machine diagnosis, it's more neutral in that the, the kinds of faults that we see from the machines are likely to repeat over time. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, it's dangerous to assume in, in, in most cases that the abnormal behavior is coming from some fixed probability distribution. So uh, in my group, we've conducted an experimental study of the very large literature on anomaly detection methods. And we chose eight different anomaly detection algorithms, which are listed along this axis here. And we generated uh, more than 25,000 different benchmark anomaly detection data sets. Um, and then we systematically, these data sets systematically control various relevant parameters of these problems. And we found uh, on two different metrics, um, uh, called logit AUC and log lift, that the isolation forest algorithm was the overall best performer. Uh, and, um, and so this is one of the reasons that now at Big ML, we offer isolation forest as one of our services. But I should point out that several other algorithms uh, also work very well, including the very popular LOF method and also a recently developed method called LODA that, that I like very much. Well, let's now consider the future of machine learning. I want to discuss five problems here uh, where I think machine learning is going right now and in the next 10 years. 
The first of these is detecting and correcting for bias in our data or in our classifiers. A second one is risk sensitive optimization. A third is generating explanations for black box systems. A fourth is verification and validation of machine learning systems. And a fifth is integrating machine learning components into larger software systems. So let's start uh, uh, by looking at the problem of detecting and correcting for bias. So one form of bias is bias against legally protected categories. So legally protected categories of people include people of different races or religions, sex, age, and so on. And uh, they are protected in, in the United States, for example, in terms of the granting of bank loans, renting or buying houses, and, and in employment. And so if we're using a machine learning algorithm from uh, collecting previous data to try to automatically grant loans and decide who gets to buy houses and so on, what constraints should this place on machine learning algorithms? And so this is a very active area of research right now. One approach or one constraint might be that we should say the algorithm should not use any information related to race or sex or age in making these decisions. But it's a little subtle. It's not enough just to ignore the category, say, of, of uh, sex uh, or age, because maybe you could infer that from a person's name or their address. And so you want to make sure that algorithms do not use any features from which these categories can be predicted or any information that can be extracted from the input features that carries information about race, sex, or age. So that might be a, a form of more blind justice. An alternative a constraint that's been proposed is that a learned predictive model should exhibit the same false positive, false negative trade-offs, that is the same what's known as the ROC curve, for each protected subgroup. So that, um, uh, sure, there will be people that will be denied loans and so on, and there might be differences across different groups, but there should be equality of opportunity across the different groups. Another kind of bias that's very important is sampling bias. So if the training data are sampled under a different distribution than the test queries or the test decisions, then the results can be very bad. For example, suppose we want to predict mortgage default rate, uh, the probability that a customer will default on their mortgage um, based on historical data, because we're trying to decide whether to give them a, a loan. Well, suppose we collected our training data in the period from 1998 to 2004 in Spain. And then our test data was from the period from 2008 to 2012 during the financial crisis. Obviously, we would, uh, you know, the, during the training data period, hardly anyone was defaulting on their mortgages, and in the test data, virtually everyone was. And so it would be very dangerous to use a classifier from built on the training data during the test period. So there are two challenges here. How can we detect the problem? Uh, and one approach, of course, is to model the distribution of the training data, and then to check that the test queries come from the, the same distribution. If the test distribution of queries matches the training distribution of queries, then um, we have strong guarantees that, uh, that, that things will, the, the predictions will be correct. And so there are various techniques like change point detection and two sample tests and so on that can be applied to answer that question. If there is a mismatch between the test and the training distribution, then we have the problem of how to correct this. And there are techniques called density ratio correction, where we reweight the training data according to the ratio of the probability of the test, uh, test probability of a query against the training probability. And then there's also a technique called domain adaptation that is searching for invariant relationships, relationships that are invariant across both distributions. But I think if we go back to my mortgage default problem, um, uh, a fundamental thing was, uh, w it might be that we weren't even correcting, collecting the correct data point, the data features um, in our training data uh, and in our test data. And unless we're really collecting the right features, um, uh, and these might be features about the housing market in general, housing prices and trends, we might still uh, not be able to detect or correct the problem in our data. The second topic I want to discuss is risk-sensitive optimization. So in automated decision-making, say with advertising or with self-driving cars, we typically seek to optimize the expected reward or the expected revenue or the total reward, total expected reward. And um, 
Uh, and this is, makes a lot of sense in many situations. However, in high risk applications, we're often concerned about the downside risk, uh, not the expected uh, probability that we will get to our destination, but uh, what's the worst case uh, time delay that it might take us to get to the airport? Or uh, the worst case might be that we actually do have a, a traffic accident and we'd like to minimize the probability of that. So um, in particular, suppose uh, that, that the, this is a probability distribution showing the probability of different possible outcome values. So if V here on the horizontal axis is the, is the total reward that we get from executing a particular decision-making rule, then, uh, and it has this kind of distribution, we see that most of the time we get nice big rewards here in the range of six to eight, but there are these times when we get, uh, uh, we have this heavy tail down here with um, very poor outcomes. And so we might be worried about the downside risk. And there are many different measures for downside risk. One that has become uh, very popular lately is known as the conditional value at risk. And that is the expected value of the worst fraction alpha of outcomes. So if we set alpha to 0.1, then we're just looking at the 10% worst outcomes and what their uh, average value is. And in this case, that means that the CVAR, the conditional value at risk, is 3.06, that's the, the average area under this curve. Uh, suppose we could choose a different decision-making rule, um, then uh, this decision-making rule uh, does not do as well in terms of the best cases, and the average reward actually will drop uh, under this policy, this decision-making rule, but the conditional value at risk here of the 10% worst outcomes is 3.94 instead of 3.06. So it, it has better worst case behavior, and we might prefer that instead. So there are a variety of algorithms that have been developed for CVAR optimization, and this again is a very active area of research. The third topic I wanted to discuss is explanations for black box machine learning systems. So some machine learning methods, particularly ensemble methods and deep neural networks, do not provide simple visualizations or explanations of their predictions. And yet we need those explanations. We need them to debug our data sets and our machine learning systems. We may need them to satisfy regulatory requirements, such as the EU's uh, new regulation on the right, users having the right to an explanation in certain situations. If we're interested in knowledge discovery, we need explanations to understand what knowledge has been discovered by the system. And of course, we need explanations to decide whether we can trust the system. Uh, when the system is getting uh, the right, uh, good answers, it's very important to know whether it's getting them right for the right reasons or whether it's uh, paying attention to some kinds of coincidences that might exi uh, uh, be exist because of weaknesses in our data set rather than because it's really finding the true causal connections in the system. So a general strategy that's being uh, pursued in research right now is to try to compute interpretable approximations of these complex machine learning systems. So we train the complex systems, um, but then we also train a uh, system that mimics them, but using a very simple and transparent representation. And this, this looks promising. A fourth challenge uh, is verification and validation. So as we move machine learning systems into really high risk applications, you know, recommending advertising is not very high risk, but controlling the steering wheel in a car is extremely high risk. So um, we need a methodology for testing and validating that these machine learning based systems achieve certain target level of accuracy. So in, for instance, we might want guarantees on obstacle recognition for self-driving cars, or a guarantee that the probability of collision is less than one per 10 million kilometers driven. Um, and so there are some promising ideas being explored, but this is still uh, just beginning to see serious research attention. One question is how can we systematically generate tests for these systems, say using simulators? And I should mention as a side issue, the construction of realistic uh, uh, simulators is a major challenge in applying machine learning in these applications. Another idea is known as adversarial learning. We actually can train up a second AI system that tries to break our, our system, tries to find the weaknesses, create images that will cause the system to make the wrong decision, and so on. 
And the third idea is reachability analysis. And this really comes out of standard software engineering and uh, program analysis tools. Can we prove that the probability of entering the collision state is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 8, for example? And a closely related challenge for the future is integrating machine learned components into larger software systems. So as we've discussed, machine learning is providing new ways of constructing software. But we would rarely, rarely, it's, it's really impossible to imagine building an entire software system by machine learning. Instead, typically machine learning constitutes a very small component of, of a software system, maybe only two, three, at most 5% of the code might be created by machine learning. And so we need software engineering processes to ensure successful end-to-end -end system performance given the machine learned components. And one thing I really recommend is a, a, some, a document written by Martin Zinkovich of Google called Rules for Machine Learning, which is his attempt to capture the best practices that they've been developing at Google for engineering machine learning into their systems. And particularly challenges with uh, retraining the system every day, deciding whether to do the, the retrain system should be deployed or not, or how to uh, roll back if problems are encountered. A uh, very insightful paper. So let me wrap up. In summary, I described the past of machine learning, how machine learning began as a way to construct software from training examples, and how, of course, this is still a major goal. But then machine learning methods also were found to be very useful for data mining and knowledge discovery. And this gave rose to a sort of sister field of, of knowledge discovery in databases which developed many other very interesting algorithms uh, that also are forms of machine learning, but mostly aimed at extracting knowledge from data rather than fully automated code. Then I reviewed three directions in, of present machine learning. The first is automated decision making, contextual bandits and reinforcement learning methods. And I mentioned that this requires the capability to perform experiments and often, if the experiments, if the problem is, is a high risk problem, then you want to perform those experiments first in simulation. So it requires the availability of high quality simulators. Then I talked about perceptual tasks and how deep learning is revolutionizing computer vision and speech recognition and other areas where the data come in the form of raw signals and uh, we can take advantage of the ability of deep learning to learn its own features rather than requiring a human feature engineer to prepare the data for machine learning. And then the third area I mentioned was anomaly detection, uh, and I discussed applications in fraud detection and cybersecurity and machine diagnosis, um, and briefly described our experiments benchmarking algorithms in the literature. And finally, I sketched five directions for machine learning in the future, one of them is detecting and correcting for bias, either bias in the way our data were collected or bias in the learned classifiers that may place certain protected groups at a disadvantage. Second, I talked about risk sensitive optimization and the need to go beyond just the expected reward or the expected cost to considering downside risk, uh, especially in high risk settings. Then uh, the importance of getting explanations out of black box systems particularly ensemble methods in machine learning and deep neural networks do not provide us uh, any kind of uh, easy to use visualization. And so this is an area of great uh, interest right now. And then the final two, we're talking more about the software engineering issues. How can we verify and validate our machine learning systems to get some kind of performance guarantees that they're robust uh, across changing inputs and how can we integrate those machine learning components into larger software systems and make sure that the resulting system works well end to end and is maintainable, debuggable, and so on. So with that, I'll close and, uh, with a final quote from Jeff Bezos, who says, machine learning and AI is a horizontal enabling layer. It will empower and improve every business, every government organization, and every philanthropy. Basically, there's no institution in the world that cannot be improved with machine learning.